Roxburgh City Council. It is February the 20th, around 6.30. And Jamie, may we have a roll call, please? Yes. Council Member Haroff? Here. Council Member Way? Here. Vice Mayor Chu? Here. And Mayor Morrison? Here. And if you're able to, please stand and say the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So do we have any public comment that is not on the agenda tonight? If so, please come up and uh, say what you need to say. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for coming. Thanks. I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sue Carp, and I live at 115 Madrone Avenue in Oxford. And I'm here tonight based on a conversation that Mr. Haroff and I had the opportunity to talk about at the um, Heart of Oxford celebration. So he encouraged me to come to this meeting. Um, and I am here to request a re oh, my question to him was, is do you ever reconsider decisions that you've made regarding different projects here in Larkspur? And he said, yes, you do. So here I am to ask for a reconsideration. And this is regarding the um, decision that was made in June to remove the Magnolia Madrone crosswalk. He said, no work has been done on it at this time, so it'd be a good time to attend the meeting. So, um, and as Ms. Mo Mrs. Morrison said, at the celebration, Large Square is attracting more and more people these days. We have a little gym of a city, and so our downtown is getting very busy. Unfortunately, um, it is a walking city, but unfortunately, it's also a jaywalking city. I, along with my Madrone neighbors, feel that the removal of the crosswalk um, that has existed for decades now will encourage more of a problem than a solution and more jaywalking in our city. Larry Meredith, who I didn't expect to be here tonight, <laughs> encouraged me to come to the meeting. And he commented that working towards a more age-friendly city means making it easier for people of all ages to get around. Madrone is not only a busy pedestrian crossing to and from our local businesses, but it's also the main entrance to a park on both sides of the street. And it's heavily used by children um, in the playground, as well as hiking and walking. The plan is to have William to the south and Arch to the north take its place. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have walked across the West Bridge on that side of the street. It's very narrow. It's enough for me and my dog, but I think when it comes to having family with kids, strollers, tricycles, um, skateboards, it's really dangerous. The city council asked for input from our citizens and we had parents here that were actually um, almost begging to have a safer crossing at Madrone. So hopefully you will listen. Madrone intersection has been neglected for years. There's never been a yield sign there as long as I can remember. I've lived there for 25 years. There's never been any pedestrian crossing sign at that crosswalk. And the white crossing stripes haven't been maintained as long as I can remember. So in closing, um, our neighboring cities of Corte Madera, Kenfield, San Rafael, and San Anselmo have all installed those crossing lights at their intersections, deemed a concern by their citizens. Larkspur really should do the same, and it's not too late to make the right decision, and that will definitely benefit our community. So thank you for your time and listening. Sue, thank you for coming and sharing that with us, your concerns. Thanks. We appreciate that. Do you want to answer anything? Well, I just want to make sure for the record that the public's aware that the project that you approved, well, the major part of the project is those lighted signs. So that was a primary motivation for the, all of the work that was proposed is so that we can install those signs. Good evening, Dr. Meredith. Good evening, um, Madam Chair. Uh, counselors, uh, I didn't realize, my name's Larry Meredith, I live in the Madrone Canyon. Uh, I didn't realize Sue was going to be here either, uh, but I uh, applaud her bringing, uh, well, I, brought, I applaud your studying it and bringing attention to the, that, that area. 
if you go out there tonight on your way home, you'll see that it, it has some lights that are there, but they're very, very yellow and not lighting up the area. Making a left turn out of Madrone is very a very risky turn, so many of us go up and over and around. I think it would the area, and I, I don't know what your plans are, but it needs to be lit up so that everyone can see. If you try and look right, and, and I invite you to drive it or and to walk it, because with so many now living in the canyon, wanting to go to Dark Park, having kids, having dogs, there's a lot going on, and it's impossible to see oncoming traffic that is very busy, as you know, uh, at in from three o'clock till probably six o'clock most days. But when it now gets to twilight, where your vision is compromised, it is very, very difficult to see what's going on there. So I customarily avoid that intersection. Uh, and I think many, more and more people are doing because it's just, uh, as, it, as it is, unsafe. And I invite you to um, walk it, drive it. So uh, what I wanted to uh, talk with you about, about tonight is the fact that uh, tobacco products kill 400,000 Americans every year. There is no safe level of tobacco consumption. Tobacco companies uh, remain profitable, uh, to remain profitable, must replace those who are either too sick to smoke or who die every year. So they have to replace that 400,000 plus another 400,000 that have COPD and other tobacco related disabilities. And the way they do it is to target our most vulnerable populations with new and fancy tasting, smelling products and delivery devices. The vaping epidemic in Marin is higher than it's ever been. And right here in Larkspur, students are vaping at levels that are previously unheard of. It is a health threat to the entire community. And Big Tobacco has no regard for Main Street and the health of communities. We need to, we need to respect that and to create and have policies that guard against our most vulnerable residents being taken advantage of and, and, and getting caught up in smoking. Because it, as with big, big alcohol, big cookie, they know that once you've started, it's very difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. And they, that, that uh, loyalty will last a lifetime. And the only way, or one of the ways that we can be helpful is to limit access. I invite you uh, to, to work with the, the county's uh, Office of, of Tobacco Control to strengthen and update your ordinance on retail tobacco sales so that you can reduce this, this, this situation. Court of Madeira had a hearing last night. They approved a, a, a new ordinance that really will strengthen uh, the, the restrictions on access to tobacco products. And I urge you and invite you to adopt an ordinance either identical to or similar to that one so that Larkspur can get an A rating by the American Lung Association and have a healthy community for all. Great. Thank you. Great. That's it. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Madam Mayor, uh, for the benefit of the public, uh, Larkspur is going to be following Corte Madera's lead. Corte Madera's uh, ordinance is actually a little different from the county's, but we'll be modeling the one we bring to you after Corte Madera so that CMPA is dealing with uniform regulations within the jurisdictions. Great. 
look forward to that. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else in the public like to make a comment that's not on the agenda tonight? All right, I see none. All right, I'll bring it back to, our, to the dais. Um, now we're, there's no presentation or proclamation, so uh, approval of the consent calendar. Would anyone, anyone like to pull anybody? Would the council like to pull anything from the consent calendar? I see none. I'm going to go to the public. Would anyone from the public like to pull anything from the consent calendar? I see none. I'll bring it back. May I have a motion? I'd like to move approval of the, con uh, the consent calendar. May second. I have a second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone up saying? I see no. All right. It is passed. Thank you. We'll move on to the city manager's oral report. Uh, first, Madam Mayor, I just want to acknowledge and thank the public works maintenance crews who were out in force uh, through our heavy rains. Um, and fortunately, while we had some water in our streets, we didn't have any major incidents for this storm, uh, which uh, is partly a testament to them working hard to keep as many of our drains clear so that the water can flow out of the community. So I really appreciate their extra effort in that regard. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight for the council and for the community is it's our practice to do our budget process over several meetings um, rather than sort of one or two meetings in June. So uh, we're not really that far away. Uh, and I'll start to be having sort of the very early conversations of how the uh, economy is doing in March and then April will really get going with department uh, meetings. So folks are interested in the city budget. Now's the time to be paying attention and giving us any preliminary feedback. Uh, other than that, uh, it's been kind of quiet around Larkspur. I guess that maybe that's attributable to ski week. I noticed a lot of folks seem to be gone. So uh, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Any questions for our city manager? But I see none. So I'll go ahead and continue on to the council members' oral reports. Anybody want to make a report, comments? Okay. Kevin, you want to go first? You can talk about anything you want, and I can oh, add. So, you can. of course. I, I just have a couple, and, and in part because the uh, Heart of Larkspur event. Uh, Kevin, we need your microphone on, please. Sorry, uh, because the Heart of Larkspur event was mentioned uh, earlier. I, I just. Uh, was there. I think several of us were there, and it just was a really spectacular event. It was a celebration of uh, volunteerism within our community, and um, it had a, a, a tremendous turnout. Um, lots of people who've been very engaged in our community for years and years and years were there. Um, some who've been engaged for less time were there as well. So it was a terrific event, and I was very glad to, to be there. Uh, a couple other events, and then I'll turn it over to Ann, that I just wanted to mention. On February uh, 12th, I attended a meeting over at the community room at uh, next to Jason's uh, for the, uh, it was a Green Bray wildfire safety event, which was sponsored by the, uh, uh, the fire agency. Um, very well attended. Uh, folks are organizing themselves in terms of uh, uh, local neighborhoods to uh, get together, uh, marshal resources, and uh, to prepare themselves uh, in the event of wildfire events coming down through our community. We're a little bit distinct over there because of the nature of the wildfire risk uh, that uh, presents itself to our neighborhood, um, which was interesting to me to learn about. If we, if we have a fire there, it's not going to be because it has anything to do with Mount Tam or anything um, south of the creek. Uh, it's going to be because of a fire that starts up in the uh, Bret Hart neighborhood and actually and sweeps down uh, our hills. So that was very illuminating, and I think uh, everyone who attended that meeting was very appreciative of the advice and, and the uh, counsel that we received about how to prepare for those kinds of catastrophic events. Um, on February 15th, a couple days later, um, I attended, and Council Member Helmer was there as well, uh, a climate, um, Court Madera's Climate uh, Adap Adaptation Plan Resilience Advisory Committee meeting, kickoff meeting, um, over in uh, Court Madera's uh, town hall. Um, they have a grant uh, of, I think, about $250,000 to do a study that will help them uh, develop uh, plans and proposals that they could incorporate in their general plan and other uh, other policies. 
uh, to help them uh, think through, in conjunction with the county, um, strategies for addressing sea level rise um, in the next 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, obviously, that's an important um, uh, process for Larkspur because we're neighbors. And uh, much of what they are considering or will be considering as part of their process will have a direct impact on us. So I'm looking forward to a continuing engagement with Corp Madeira on their climate change uh, activities. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Of course. I'll just piggyback back on to what um, Council Member Hoff said about the wildfire um, meeting. The Fire Safe Marin, which is a nonprofit organization in Marin with a terrific board that is looking at wildfire, um, creating fire wise communities, is having their annual meeting um, on March 8th, on Saturday. And I went last year, and there were several hundred people there. It's been advertised in the Marin IJ, so there'll probably be a lot more than that. But it's a very um, informative. Um, meeting in which communities and neighborhoods can learn about how to become FireWise. And you can find it on their um, website, their firewise.org website. And Kevin does have a, um, one of their flyers here if anybody's interested. There are several neighborhoods in, Mar in Larkspur and Corte Madera that are um, getting that certification underway right now. That's so, good to know. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. So I attended the Larkspur Chamber of Commerce meeting yesterday. And it was really productive. It was exciting. We talked about um, changing the, the directors. We talked about uh, uh, rearranging the bylaws and giving term limits. Uh, we talked about maybe bringing on more board members um, and also making the board a little more productive in the fundraising. So it was really productive, very pleased with the outcome. And it was actually, everyone seemed a lot, in, they were quite enthused about the process and excited for the future of the chamber. So. That's good. I also attended the Larkspur Corona Madera Safe Routes to School Task Force with Julian. And I do want to read, and I'll make it quick, an email that was sent to me by the assistant principal. It says, a month into the spring semester, we continue to experience success with our student parking policy. Campus assistants and administrators are reporting that students have been great following the guidelines of our new student parking policy. They also mentioned that um, Part of the policy, student drivers who park on campus are not allowed to leave campus during the lunch period with their cars, which we all know. Any students needing to leave campus in their car at any point during the school day must do so after receiving a valid permit. Uh, groups of students have, who have made a commitment to carpooling must have three or more passengers in cars to park in their assigned space, and someone is out there observing the parking lots. Um, Ride-sharing vehicles such as Uber and Lyft cannot come onto campus, but they are being used and kids are being dropped off in front of school. Um, food delivery services, which the kids are taking advantage of, Uber Eats and DoorDash and Grubhub um, are not allowed to come onto campus and uh, deliver food. So, and they also had a big student assembly reminding the students to behave when they're parking in a residential area and it's something that's being consistently discussed and, um, and, and trying to understand and, and work it out. So that was great. And they added more parking spaces too for the kids. Kevin Harf and I attended with Dan Schwartz along with the task force um, ex uh, committee meeting. It's called the Larkspur Library and Community Center. I'd like to announce the task force, which is going out for private and public funds. They reached their goal quickly, which was 50,000. Um, so that's they're, they're want a lot more than that. But just in a few months, they were very, they were very pleased with um, the donations of it's actually 51,160. So that's exciting. So the city's matching when they when they reach the 50,000, we'll match that. We'll go up to 150 total. So um, they're on their way, and they're with this money. They hired partnership resource group to help them raise funds to continue to do so. So they're on a really good start. So very pleased. All right, with that, any we're all done. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will move on to public hearing, which I see none. Uh, we'll move on to the business items. 8.1 fiscal year 2017-18 audit of the city basic financial statement. Uh, we're going to receive a presentation, and that is by Vicky Vicky Rodriguez. Hi, Vicky. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
good evening. Uh, thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, my name is Vicki Rodriguez. I'm the engagement partner from Mays & Associates, uh, who is in charge of conducting the audit of the city's financial statements. So we did complete the audit for the city's financial statements for fiscal year ended June 30, 2018. We have issued an unmodified opinion, which is the cleanest opinion that the city can receive. So congratulations for that. Um, included in the opinion, there is an emphasis of a matter that's relating to a change in accounting principle that's just relating to the implementation of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board number 75, which requires the city, well, all municipalities, to now put the entire net OPEB liability, that's the other post-employment benefits, but put the entire net o OPEB liability on the city's financial statements. So relating to that implementation, that did require restatement in the financial statements. Um, it did reduce the overall city's net position by 14 million um, and also required some expansion of footnotes. So you'll, you'll see in the financial statements um, a lot of information about the other post-employment benefits. Um, overall, the citywide financials um, are healthy. They increased uh, net position uh, last fiscal year by 6.4 million, so that, that's a good sign. Um, also, just looking at the general fund, the general fund also had a healthy increase of 1.4 million in its fund balance. So overall, um, overall healthy financials. Um, the audit itself went very smooth. We had no issues, had no difficulties. Um, thank you very much to Kathy and her team for providing everything to us in a timely manner and being responsive and uh, giving us everything we needed to get the job done. So I uh, just wanted to say thank you to the city um, and, and staff for, for um, just being very well prepared for the audit. Um, are there any questions for me relating to the audit or the financial statements? Okay. We do. We do. Yeah. Okay. Right there. Uh, okay. Um, you know, regarding GASB 45, uh, oh. you know, I, I throw that out there and nobody knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, uh, Councilmember Harroff and myself are involved in is, you know, all the cities mm -hmm. are participating in uh, issuing. Uh, a report right now, actually, city managers involved in that too. Larkspur's got good representation. And, and this report, uh, you know, one of the recommendations is to make the audits uh, not more transparent. You know, it, it's, we're not trying to hide anything, but something that the general public can understand. So, I mean, like yourself, you just threw out four, $14 million difference because of difference in reporting. But even if you were to go and say, well, that's because it's uh, being changed to entry age normal, well, that doesn't mean anything to anybody either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, those footnotes need to be able to explain to the public that, you know, the, the difference in this well, $14 million, whatever it is, is because the liabilities are being calculated as a result of the person's total time within the system as opposed to just what they've accrued in benefits up to that point. Now, yes. even that point, the way I just stated it, is more clear, but it's still not, may not be totally understandable to the average person reading it. But what they see is this huge difference, mm -hmm. and you know that leads one to believe that oh well, your financial condition is a lot worse. Well, one could also say that it was always there; it's now just being reported. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes, and I, I think one of the main things to to consider is is that when you when you're looking at the 14 million, because you know, a lot of times people will say like, oh my goodness. But this, this is a long-term liability. So this well, is looking at all of your active employees and all of your retirees. So it's not something that's going to get paid over tomorrow or the next no. five years. But, but it's, it's not about the liability. We, mm -hmm. you know, as I said, we know the liability exists. It's not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. But people need to be able to understand what it is they're, they're reading so that, um, you know, one of the things we try to do is get people more educated about how our budget works, how we spend money, how we make money. And when we run into situations where, say, CalPERS reduces the discount rate, then, mm -hmm. you know, there's some logic 
there rather than um, seeing then all these articles in, in the editorials where you, you, you read it in person, it's like, well, they, they have no clue what they're talking about. You know, they, they know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. so, so the whole concept is to get the audit in a way that can be written so that footnotes and other things can be more understandable to the general public. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I definitely believe that governmental accounting reporting has gotten more complicated, so I, I'm in agreement with that. Okay. Um, w one of the things, uh, looking at the balance sheet, or as you would call it in governmental accounting, the statement of net assets, um, is, is there a way to show actually assets that can be, that have some liquidity? as opposed to showing what appears here to be solvency purely because you have $66 million in assets. Larry, where are you? What page? Um, I think he's on page 16. Page 7. Page 7. Oh, page 7. Thank you. You know, if, if you were to look at everything under GASB 45, you know, we, we are not liquid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there are assets there that cannot be used to cover the liability, even though, like you said, the liability is stretched out over decades. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, you know, when you look at capital assets, um, there are things that we can't sell. We can't sell our road. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we can sell City Hall. Mm -hmm. So really, that, that provides the better picture of, of what our financial... Uh, health and solvency is? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it might be helpful because the, this um, looking at uh, the table on page 7 as well as because that kind of mirrors the statement that's on page 16, which is your statement of net position. So that's the overall includes all of the city's assets, all of the city's liabilities, current, long term, um, everything. I think if you're looking for something that's more on um, to show liquidity or, or something that's more just like one year out, uh, it may be better to kind of look at the fund level statements which start on page 20. Uh, and so that's where it breaks out by the general fund and the capital projects. But that's more of the short term. That's kind of how you budget. So that's looking out just as of June 30, 2018, and only includes the current current assets and current liabilities. Yeah. So if you're looking more from a, a liquidity standpoint. Well, I know the information's all there. Mm -hmm. My, again, it's about readability, because I just spent the last six months going through every city's financials. Mm -hmm. OK, so I, I know how difficult it was to try and compile the information we need to do this report. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that the average person can possibly look at this and have a, a, a sense of, you know, the true story behind our, our financials. Mm -hmm. um, well, we, I mean, we follow audit standards and we follow the um, pronouncements under government accounting standards. Board, well, I understand so, that, but uh, this is not about what we follow. Mm -hmm. It's about information that we're giving to the public so that they can be better educated about what we do here and how we spend their money. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so just one more point. Okay. Um, there, I can't remember what page it's on. It's back there like in note 10 or something like that. Um, there, there is a, I brought this up last year too, but I didn't get a response on it. Um, there's a table that shows the asset mix in CalPERS. So note 10, let's see, that's got to be like way down there in the 50s. Uh, note, note 10. Note 10. That's on page 54. The one where it yeah, shows the okay. asset Yeah, bonds. so you, you got the asset mix there. Mm -hmm. we, we know the discount rate's heading towards 7%, mm -hmm. which a number of people, if they've ever analyzed it, would still say it's still too high. Mm -hmm. Um, you have an asset mix there that probably averages somewhere around three and a half to four percent. So, what is that table trying to show? Because really, what it tells you is that no matter what they try and do with their current assets, medium term, which is up to ten years, and long term, ten years and beyond, that you're still not going to make your number. Yes. So you, the table is thrown out there, but there's no story. 
there's no analysis either. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the purpose of putting that in, in there without any kind of um, either of the two, either a story or, or an analysis of it? Because the analysis would say, you know, this is insufficient and we should be preparing for even a lower discount rate, in which case over the course of the next five to ten years, it's budgeting more for increases in your annual required contributions. Mm -hmm. But there's no such discussion about that. Well, I think that, well, so, so the table in here is the, um, what is the required disclosure in the financial statements. I think if you're looking more for, for the story or, or more explanation, then uh, you would need to go research further into like CalPERS actuarial valuations. And so, so that may pr provide more information that you're looking for. Well, it's not a matter of me. Again, it's for the public. You, it mm -hmm. states there that the current discount rate is like 7.1 percent. You look at this table and you say, well, this doesn't make sense. Um, it, they're never going to make the number. So we're in trouble. We are in trouble. <laughs> yeah, but nobody is saying we're in trouble. You have, to de you have to deduce that by knowing what you're reading. Now, on the OPEB side, it's a little better. Mm -hmm. Because that asset mix is closer to the three and change percentage, so. Yes, and, and, and mainly because the OPEB is very specific to the city versus uh, where the pension plan, there's many, many different agencies all in one plan. And so th this makeup of investments may not just be specific for the city, but for the overall pool, whereas OPEB is, is much more specific just to the city's um, OPEB plan. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, I thought I had one more, but this one really is one more. Um, is, is there also a, a write-up on any of your findings? Yes, we did um, issue a, a memorandum on internal control, which is um, our version of the management letter. Um, so, yes, I'm not sure if that has been provided for this meeting or if it will be provided later, but we, we have issued okay. one. Hope everyone answered the question correctly when we were asked, do you know of any internal controls? Yeah. Do, do we know where that letter's been? Is anybody stuck? Or is that something that usually gets in this document? It doesn't usually get added to this yeah. document. Yeah, okay. so I haven't seen this year's it's either. A, it's a separate report. I see. Yeah, we, we know that there are things you've identified in the past, but the fact is we're a small agency with what? two or three people doing yes. the finances, so it, yes. you can't get the internal controls if you tell us you need five people. Exactly, and, and so, I mean, just, just so that I can disclose, um, you know, s s most of the comments are similar to prior year. I mean, we have the one related to uh, super user rights, which, mm -hmm. again, if you only have a couple people in your, your department, it is very difficult to get past that. So you are going to have some, um, some internal control conflicts because just uh, because of the minimal number of staff. Um, so n I don't believe that there are any comments that are new okay, this year. That's so, good. Um, just sorry. Um, at least nothing, nothing significant or material. I think we did have, a, um, you know, other matters, you know, we'll provide information um, on, you know, a couple of cleanup items and on the new Gasbys that are coming up mm -hmm. over the next few years, but there wasn't anything uh, no uh, internal control matters that were sig significant that were new this year compared to prior year. Okay. Well, Kathy and Dan have done a good job of trying to mitigate the existing exposure we have. So, mm -hmm. yes. thank you. Yes. Great questions. All right. Tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for. Well, wasn't it here? So it's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Anybody else? Any other council members? I just want to uh, share an observation based upon some of um, Council Member Two's comments. Um, you guys did a great job with the audit, and I really appreciate it. And I understand you're op you're operating within certain constraints about what is appropriate in the context of an audit. Um, the issues that uh, the Council Member raises are are extremely valid issues. Um, obviously, well, on the OPEP side, we're trying to confront them mm -hmm. on a Marin County wide basis, um, but they also raise policy considerations that kind of go beyond, I think, the audit function, mm -hmm. um, which is not to diminish their importance. It just 
says where's the appropriate venue for consideration of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think absolutely it's horrifying where we are with CalPERS. Um, there's a lot of work to do with uh, our city and other cities and other communities throughout the state of California to deal with what has been created there. Um, but I don't know that we can expect too much from you in an audit function to address those issues. So thank you. Thank you. Catherine, do you have any questions? No, 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 it's just a presentation. Vicki, oh. thank you. You did okay. a great job. Okay, thank you. All righty. Uh, I do want to go to the public. Does anybody from the public have any questions? Come on up. Oh, no, you need to come to the mic and you need to say your name and where you're from. Hello, my name is Debbie. I've been a resident of Larkspur since 1982. Love this little town. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. A lot of the um, cities in Marin are trying to restrict 5G, and I, I don't see that Larkspur is joining in on yeah. that fight. Can you oh, elaborate you know, Debbie, on that? You're, you're supposed to come during public comment um, that we have on the very beginning of the meeting. Oh. So, but I do know that that's going to be a discussion coming up in, our, in the near future. Okay, not tonight, though? Not tonight. Okay, but yeah. it is coming up. It is going to come up. And can you tell me? Oh, about Debbie, you know what? It, you need to come at public meeting. Oh, okay. Right now, we're doing business items. Okay. But thank you for coming. Right. Appreciate it. Come again. Okay, we will move on. Madam right. Mary, there, there should be a vote to accept. The oh, wait, there is a vote to accept. Yeah, just, you just need to take a vote to okay. accept the audit. So I need to have a, right, a, a motion. I'd like to move to accept the, uh, uh, the audit for this, this fiscal year. Great. And a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone sustain? I see no. None? Okay. There you go. Thank Perfect. You. Thanks, Vicki. All right. We'll move on to 8.2. Uh, receive project update for the Bon Air Bridge replacement project. Julian Skinner, we'd love your updates, especially on the Bon Air Bridge. <laughs> Members of council, members of the public, Julian Skinner, Public Works Director. Um, tonight we have uh, an update on one of our capital, our biggest capital project. This is the Bonaire Bridge replacement. Um, there's no action requested of council tonight. This is just a uh, update. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we said we would come before you every six months or so, or when there was a significant change in construction, to uh, give both the council and the public an update um, on the project overall. Um, so briefly tonight, I'm going to go over a little bit of project review for those that don't have the context or the background. Um, talk about some of the uh, construction work that's taken place to date, and then the two main things that we track throughout the project are the cost and the schedule. Uh, I want to make sure it comes in on budget and on time, and then we'll have a period of time for questions at the end. Uh, here's the background information that we provided during the last update. Um, so back in March of um, last year, you awarded a contract to the low bidder, that's Golden State uh, Bridge. Uh, the contract includes just over four years of anticipated construction. Uh, the awarded contract price was $26.7 million, uh, and Golden State's first day on the job was May 23rd of last year. Um, so just for some context to go over the uh, components of this project, it's a bridge project, but there's some other components to it too. Um, this is an aerial view looking towards the south. Um, so the bridge, obviously that's the existing bridge. Um, this project completely removes and replaces it with a new uh, structure. And then Bonaire Road itself uh, to the west of the bridge gets uh, reconstructed, new asphalt, new sidewalks all the way to Magnolia intersection. And then the two intersections at either end of the bridge get reconstructed with uh, new ADA compliant traffic signals and uh, crosswalks and ramps. So that's the intersection at Magnolia and also at South Elysio. And then another component of the project is a storm drain pump station. So this will be a new pump station on Bonaire Road, um, just kind of south of Harvard Drive um, that will serve not only the drainage for uh, Bonaire Road, but also the adjacent Hillview subdivision. So uh, zooming in on the bridge, and now we're flipped around and north is up on this page. Um, so construction sequencing in general, uh, we're building this bridge in two halves. So this is to accommodate uh, keeping traffic moving over the bridge throughout the four years of construction. 
Uh, we're basically going to uh, remove the north half of the bridge and then build a new north half of the bridge, and then we'll do the same thing um, on the south side. And uh, we are uh, accomplishing that by building uh, temporary bridges or trestles in the creek on either side of the bridge uh, from which they can work. Um, and so this is kind of a, a schematic of, of the new bridge. The existing bridge is on over 100 piles um, in the creek. This one will have eight bigger piles um, in the creek. So there's four on each side, uh, four for the northern half of the bridge, and then there will be another four uh, for the southern half of the bridge. Um, and those piles will extend up um, to bent caps, and then new girders uh, will go on top and the bridge deck on top of that. So looking at what they've done so far, uh, first step was demolition. So this is looking in at the um, east side of the bridge. And so traffic has been squeezed over to the south side of the bridge. A new concrete barrier was placed to separate the uh, moving traffic from the construction area. And they started to dismantle the railing on the north side of the bridge and then uh, chip away at some of the northern uh, side of the bridge because the new northern half of the bridge overlaps somewhat with the old northern. So they have to uh, demolish some of the north side of the bridge. Um, and then the installation of the trestle. So again, starting at the east side, uh, the trestle is a temporary bridge. Um, steel piles driven into the creek and then a wooden platform on top of that from which they can work. Uh, so they basically start building it from the one side and then they start pulling the crane out onto the trestle they've already built. Uh, and then that crane in turn puts the new uh, piles in and it just keeps crawling across uh, the creek until it's made it the whole way across. So that was completion of the main trestle um, in late summer of last year. Um, and then in addition to the main trestle, which is that new bridge that goes across, uh, there's little what they call finger trestles. Um, that go between the, uh, the long trestle and the existing bridge that the uh, cranes actually crawl out on to do the work so they can get closer to the, uh, where the new piles are going to go. Um, so if we look from above, uh, you can see the top uh, crossing here is the old bridge, and then there's a new trestle down below. And then here you see th three fingers um, that are projecting out to the existing bridge. That's, that's the platform from which the cranes actually work to construct the new bridge. Uh, there's a fourth one here, um, the second from the left that's still under construction during this photo. Um, here's a picture from the trestle itself, uh, looking towards Marin General. And so off to the right are the fingers, and kind of the, the red blob in the middle there is a crane sitting on uh, one of the fingers. Um, so if we look down a little bit closer to what they've been doing, uh, a lot of what they've done so far has all been down in the creek, so there hasn't been a lot to, to, to see. Uh, from the surface, but if you look at where these fingers are, um, in between those is where the new uh, CIDHs go. So they're the four big piers that are going to go in to support the northern half of the bridge. Um, and CIDH stands for cast in drilled hole. So basically they're uh, drilling a large diameter, eight foot diameter um, hole down about 100 feet into the creek bed. Um, and then they pour concrete into it and that's the foundation for um, the bridge. The first step they did was put in cofferdams, which um, isolate the work area from the creek so that it uh, doesn't have water in it. So this is one of the first things that uh, folks saw out there as they were driving by. Um, on the left, the picture shows the sheet piles that are actually segments that uh, interlock together um, that get driven down um, into the creek surface. Um, and then on the right is an installed cofferdam. It's a little dark in that photo, but basically outside of the cofferdam, the creek comes up and down, and then inside the cofferdam is dry so they can construct the column. Um, and then they drill down um, into the creek bed. So this is uh, the drill rig on the left that sits on the fingers, and then on the right is a photo of the actual drill bit. That's what um, they've been using to uh, core out these holes. Um, so for context, that drum there is eight feet uh, in diameter. And then as they drill, there's up to three cranes uh, that were on the trestle. Um, and then on the right is a photo of, of the large red tanks that you see out there as you drive by the site. So as they drill these holes down into the creek bed, they pump a slurry into the hole so the hole doesn't cave in. Uh, when they then fill the hole with concrete, that slurry comes out. It has to go into these tanks and settle um, until it doesn't have any contaminants left in it. And then they can put it, uh, they can discharge it to the sewer. Um, so that's why there's still tanks out there today, because they have to test the, the slurry that comes out of these holes. The big so, yellow tanks? No, they're, they're red, actually, these ones. 
Uh, they're all, they were, I don't know if these ones are still here. There's definitely still ones on the west side uh, by Hillview. Um, so after they've drilled the hole, the next thing they do is they drop in the reinforcement. So um, this is the cage that's laid out on the trestle on the left. So there's a photo here of them making sure that everything's tied together before it goes down. Uh, and then on the right is the crane that's dropping uh, this 100 foot long cage down into the, down into the hole. And then again, there's a, uh, a photo from above. Uh, this is uh, the crane. It's hard to see right in the middle of the photo there, the purple. Um, that's the rebar cage that's being dropped into the hole, uh, just for size references to how deep that, that hole is. And again, uh, the, the rebar is coated in uh, purple. That's a requirement for the marine environment. So I think people have seen regular uh, rebar steel, and then sometimes you see a green epoxy steel. Uh, for corrosion, uh, a requirement for a marine environment like this is the purple epoxy coating that protects the, the steel. Um, so again, on the left, there is the cage about halfway in uh, to the hole, and then on the right, a concrete truck or many concrete trucks pull up, um, and they fill that uh, hole with concrete, and that was some of our long days. Um, the hole is 100 feet deep and um, eight feet across, and you don't want to stop pouring concrete halfway. You keep going until you bring the concrete all the way up to the top. Um, so just briefly going over the work sequence again, what we've seen. So this was the existing condition. That's the old bridge. Uh, first thing they did was they demolished uh, a section of the old north section of the bridge that was going to conflict with the new north section. Um, and then uh, the bottom here on the left hand is the new construction that we're currently doing. And then on the right, the traffic is squeezed over to the southern side of the existing bridge. And so everything that's taken place today is kind of in this orange box and below. It's all down in the creek. Uh, we're now out of the water. The columns are poured. And so um, as you'll see when I get to the schedule, the next thing that will happen is the concrete will go on top of the columns. Those are called the bent caps. Uh, and essentially, they act as a support for the, um, for the girders that form uh, the foundation of the, uh, the, the deck for the bridge. So the girders are essentially the same as a floor joist, um, and they get strung across their parallel with the running direction of the bridge, and they support the bridge deck. Um, so those are the next things you'll see on the northern half, and then a few uh, a year or so down the road, you'll see us flip over to um, the southern half, uh, so traffic will flop over to the new north uh, constructed bridge. Then they will demolish the south old bridge, um, and then they'll work on constructing the new southern half of the bridge from the southern trestle. Um, so here's a summary. This is in the staff report. We track the costs to date to, to see where we're at. Um, as far as uh, working days go, we're about 17% calendar-wise through the project, if you just count the construction days. Uh, and so far, we're about 25% through the work is completed. Now, that's a little skewed. We can't project that and say we're going to finish early because, as I'll get into with the schedule, we've got some months now where we've got some uh, pretty restrictive environmental conditions that will slow the pace of the work um, until June or so. Um, and then the other thing we track is the change orders. Uh, Caltrans allots a 10% um, allowance to the project for change orders or unforeseen conditions. and so. Uh, we've spent about 25% of the um, base contract, um, but we're only about 9% of the way through uh, change orders. So we always want to make sure that the change orders are, are tracking lower than the construction costs. Uh, project schedule, this again is taken from the staff report, and what I did was throw it into um, kind of a timeline um, to show graphically kind of where, where we started and what we'll go through, where we're at and then overlaid it with um, some of the work window restrictions. And so uh, starting at the left here where it says start, that was our uh, May start date all the way over to the right in the middle of 22 would be the contract finish date. And so uh, starting with the work tasks, uh, we're on the north side. We basically do the foundation first, which is the, the piers into the creek. Then we'll do what's called a substructure, which is the columns, which have been started, and then the bent caps. And then we'll get into the superstructure, which is the girders and the bridge deck. Um, and then when the northern half is finished and we can flop traffic over, then we'll start working on the south side. And it'll be the same uh, construction sequence on the south side. So if anybody missed anything on the north side, stand by. You can see the same thing again on the south side. 
And then at the top here, uh, just to kind of um, add to why this project is being stretched out over four years, these are our constraints. And so uh, these are the, there's a lot of environmental conditions um, with this project, and these are the two most significant that are affecting the schedule. The top one is uh, the Ridgeway Rail. Um, and so starting in about mid-January, all work on the north side of the bridge has to cease. Uh, we have to do surveys to determine whether the, the bird is there. Um, and these are surveys that have to be spaced out four weeks apart, and you have to do four of them. So that's a, a, a time chunk there where we cannot work on the north side of the bridge. Uh, then uh, when we get the results from the survey, assuming there's no birds there, we have to get both the federal and the state agencies to certify that we did the surveys properly and yes, there's no birds there. Uh, that's why this window um, is shown kind of faded uh, because it depends on how long those agencies take to approve the surveys. Um, if you get a survey that shows there's birds there or if the agencies don't approve your surveys, then you have to wait till September 1st before you can work in that location again. Um, based on four surveys and the time it takes to do that and getting a quick turnaround from the agencies, we could be back working in May. So that's why that period is a little gray at the end. It's, it could, we could be back as early as May or we could have to wait as late as September. Um, the other restriction that's on there is for in-water work. Um, that's the blue bar, that's a steelhead. So for this period, we're not allowed to work in the water and that's both sides of, of the bridge. So. Um, as you see where the blue arrow is right now, uh, if you drive by, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on out there. One, we can't work in the water because of the steelhead, and two, we're doing the rail surveys. So you'll see them working on the abutments on either side. Uh, you'll see them coming up working on some of the approaches and the pump station, uh, but we can't work on the north side of the bridge because we're in that rail uh, survey at the moment. Um, so the schedule, kind of the next work that we anticipate seeing out there, the storm drain pump station, we're reviewing all the submittals uh, right now. Uh, we anticipate the contractor mobilizing to start building the storm drain pump station uh, in spring, uh, and it'll take over summer, uh, and it'll be finished in fall. And that's, um, again, on the north side of the road, just west of the bridge. Uh, the intersection at Magnolia and Bonaire, so that's one of the first things they did. If you go back and look at the survey, when this project first started, uh, we had both the blue and the red restrictions. So even though they started in May, they couldn't do any work in the creek because of the environmental conditions. So they started working at the Bonaire-Magnolia intersection, um, but they ran into an underground PG&E cable um, that uh, was not deep enough for us to continue the work, and so we've been waiting for PG&E to lower that, which they need to do before we can... Uh, recommence doing the work at Magnolia and Bonaire. Uh, we were given a date of March for uh, PG&E to get in and lower that facility, so we're hopeful as soon as they uh, complete that, we can get in and uh, get that intersection finished. It gets new signals, and we'll finish the paving and things like that. Um, and then uh, after the bird surveys, uh, the next thing you'll see is the bent caps. So this will actually be construction. You'll see out of the water, you'll see the bridge start to take place, start to take shape on the north side. Um, so early summer, and then after the bent caps are in place, the girders come in and they basically um, get erected on top of the bent caps. Uh, that does require a one week road closure. Um, so that'll happen twice, once for the north side, once for the south side. Um, there's one other one week road closure too at the end of the project where we've got the two halves of the bridge built and we've got to fill in the middle. Um, so. As it is now, the contractor is projecting that this one-week road closure is kind of falls on his schedule um, in fall, so September-ish. We are trying as best we can to accelerate the schedule to have that one-week closure while school's out, uh, so to get it done before August. But uh, that will require um, A, our birds not to show up, uh, and B, is to get uh, a really timely approval of the bird surveys from the regulatory agencies, and then also a couple of other things in their schedule have to really fall into place, and we can pull that date forward, so fingers crossed. Um, and then after the girders are installed, the next thing is the, the bridge deck, which is the concrete driving surface, and then the railing uh, and everything like that. Um, still unsure as to if the contractor is going to install the south side trestle um, this fall or next spring. Again, he's got to do that when the water window is open. He's not going to need it for a while, but there may be some advantage to installing it sooner rather than later in case a gap shows up in the schedule, he uh, can move forward. 
Um, and then the other thing is um, kind of the first milestone is flopping the traffic over uh, to the new north side of the bridge, which we're thinking will be um, just over a year from now. So next spring, we should have the northern half of the bridge finished. We'll be moving traffic over, and then we'll start demolishing and doing everything on the, on the south side of the bridge. Um, this is a snapshot of our website, which has uh, undergone some renovations as of late, and um, there's some more relevant information uh, for the current construction that's up there now. We have a newsletter that's linked. It's in the header uh, in here, and it's also the first tab on the right, construction updates. Um, and that on the right is the newsletter for February that kind of talks about what's going on out there now and what are the next uh, anticipated tasks that, that people would see. It also has on there um, the hotline and an email that are dedicated to the bridge, and they'll go right to um, our team uh, for answering any questions that the public may have. Um, so we anticipate being back uh, in front of you in fall, hopefully after the girders have been installed to give you the next um, update on the bridge project. And I am available for any questions. Julian, thank you for the thorough uh, update. It's uh, pretty impressive how, how it does seem like it's going pretty quickly and smoothly. I know there's lots of questions, not only from the council, from the public. So I'll start with the council. Any, uh, any questions? Right. Larry, do you have questions? Yeah, um, regarding the um, Ridgeway, Ridgeway Rail, formerly known as the Clapper Rail, um, in your previous surveys, you didn't find anything. Is that correct? Um, yeah, we have not had any positive surveys. We had one survey that had an anomaly in it that wasn't completely clean, um, but yeah, we're not anticipating, and they've already done two of the four surveys this year, and they were both clean. So we're not anticipating um, the bird being there. Yeah, what I'm wondering is that, you know, this is a four-plus year project, and at what point does Fish and Wildlife determine that it's really <laughs> not there so that we don't have that blackout period? Um, hopefully they would have done that already yeah, and we be careful did, how you answer that question <laughs> we, we we did we did try um, this is probably the last year where it'll be a significant issue for us the clapper rail is not an issue the ridgeway rail is not an issue on the south side of the bridge it's only yeah. a constraint on the north side construction so um, as we move further on the project and most of the work is on the south side it won't be as restricted as restrictive to us. Uh, but we have asked the questions before, how many negative surveys in a row do we need before we, you know, in order to not have to do the surveys anymore? And we are told each year, you need to do them again, so. Well, that's really not answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. But we can start in May. Hopefully. If so, assuming that we get, um, assuming that we get two more negative One more. surveys, okay. yeah. Um, it's the, the May, again, it's not a hard date because we basically take that survey information and we have to send it to both federal and state agencies. Right. They have to review it and they have to send their approval back to us. So yeah. uh, we'll definitely, our consultants are definitely on board and have definitely been making early contact with those agencies to let them know it's, it's coming to see if we can um, get those determinations sooner rather than later. Great, good news, okay. Um, Catherine? So, Julian, I, like I said earlier before the meeting, I think that new project uh, website looks really good. It's very much more user-friendly than we've had before, so I appreciate that your staff did that. I think it's easy for the community to, to really look at the very specifics of this project, so I encourage everybody to look at bonairbridge.org, right? Dot com. It, dot com, okay. Um, but my question is about the um, three intendants uh, full bridge stop. Is that a full traffic stop? Or, or only vehicles? No, it is a everything stop. Um, and it's basically a, a public safety issue. The girders um, require multiple cranes and lots of things going on. And we've had conversations before about what is feasible to sneak through uh, or to get through after hours. And we keep landing on, on the same answer that for one week that, that we think it's, it's best for public safety just to restrict access completely to the bridge um, for, for that for that week, so that's uh, no no traffic of any sort across the bridge. And then, how would that impact the the east side South Elysio intersection? Is that also going to be 
blocked or is it mostly coming back onto the bridge surface itself? That intersection would be fully functional other than you couldn't proceed straight on Bonaire, you would have to turn left yeah. onto South Alicia and vice versa. Coming off <laughs> South Alicia, you'd have to turn right onto Bonaire. Okay. Yep. I will just encourage us to publicize that very well, um, which I know this website is really good, but I'd just encourage us to make sure because that we've been very um, hesitant to close it, although I understand that the, the need to do that and, and particularly for public safety need to do that. But just, you know, getting people heads up early on would be I think something we have to focus on. And, I, and how will you do that? Um, so we, um, we have already up on the website, we have some flyers that were generated that outline what the detour route is. Um, and again, we'll reach out with our stakeholders, our nearby businesses, um, to give them the same information so that their clients are aware. Um, and then we'll have information out on the uh, city website and we'll be announcing it here at the public meetings. We have um, a big screen. We have a... Um we have, so we will, we're going to talk about changeable message signs. So we had those similar to just before we started construction, we right. had those out on the site that said Bonaire so Road helpful. upcoming. Mm -hmm. um, it's typical to say bridge closed and, and the dates and have those out there for a couple of weeks in advance. And again, it is a lot smoother operation if we can do it when school's out before the traffic picks up. So that's what we're, um, that's what we're aiming for. We've got another level of outreach to do if we're doing it during the school year, um, obviously. And again, we talk with our emergency partners. It's very important that they're all aware of um, the, the routes to and from the hospital and wherever else they may be going. Great. Thank you. Could put in like a Tom Sawyer type of ferry, you know, maybe a barge and bring people across with a little a mule Cars. and a car. <laughs> <laughs> they do it any, across Mississippi. Any other questions, Kevin? No, no I'm good. Kevin? Uh, a council member, too, actually asked the, the question that I was going to ask about the rail, uh, the rail surveys. So, uh, I just wanted to, to make a, a comment, really, and say how terrific it is to see this project moving forward. Um, this is a, an example of uh, small cities in California making great progress with a significant infrastructure project. And when we're seeing the challenges that we're facing at the state with the high-speed rail project apparently going down the drain and other projects around the country facing challenges, to see a major project being undertaken successfully by this community is just very rewarding to see. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, well said, Kevin. And I live next door to the Bonner Bridge, and it's been amazing to see the equipment, like the rhubarb, the, the size, the length, and then watch it being drilled in. It's just, been, it's just been really amazing to watch. And then having not as much stuff exist now, it looks so clean. and. It looks like it's ready to ready to be traveled upon. Uh, Julian, I just have two questions. Um, street lights. For the first time ever, I'm watching people, um, cars. Just everyone stopped on the on the four way or or two way. No one's traveling or three way. No one's traveling. So the first time I'm watching cars go through red lights because they see. You no, know, this is on Bonaire and, and Magnolia, and um, even even. Uh, by South Alicio. So is there a way we can have sensor lights? Just because we're all staring at each other waiting for it to turn green. Right. Um, so yeah, the issue, um, as you mentioned, is we don't have sensors because the road was ground out in anticipation of finishing that intersection and then we ran into the PG&E issue. So we were not intending to go as long as we have with fixed time, which is basically what we have out there. The traffic consultant analyzes the peak flow traffic and times the signal so that they don't back traffic up during the peak hours. And unfortunately, what that means is off peak, if somebody's coming through that intersection at two o'clock in the morning, they're going to sit there with a green light in the other direction because the, the, the signal timing is fixed. Um, there, the, there are uh, new sensors uh, included in the intersection upgrade. Okay. So uh, provided that PG&E are able to remove that facility that's conflicting, we will be moving forward. And then in three or four months, we will have uh, signals that, that are timed. Um, there Times is, or, or sen censored. sorry, censored, okay. yeah, Thank censored, you. um, uh, for vehicle traffic and the same, uh, for Elysio, um, there are provisions to do it temporarily, but there's a cost associated with it mm -hmm. and it would be a, a city cost. It's not something that the contractor is responsible for. Um, so yeah. 
if okay. I, it's something we could evaluate if there's an issue in pg e come back and say we can't move this for a year or something like that then we would start to have that conversation about um you know whether the delay that people are experiencing at those intersections is acceptable or not okay and i'm extremely disappointed with pg and e i mean that sidewalks have just been sitting there dormant i mean no one's been able to work on it and it just it does cause a bit of confusion it's unfortunate. It's old infrastructure. I don't it's think terrible, they though. had any, you know, uh, understanding of, of what depth it was installed at. It's clearly not the people that work there now that installed it. So it's right. just something they've inherited, and it's an unforeseen condition. It, it happens. So. I look forward to March okay. for it to get done. Julian, thank you. Any other questions from the council? All right, I'm going to open up to the public. Anybody from the public have questions for, for us? Hi, Steve. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Steve Whitcomb, um, 75 Cornell Avenue. Um, I, most of my comments are going to be uh, related to the uh, Bonaire Bridge replacement project and the pumping station, mostly from the perspective of the, the uh, Hillview neighborhood. Um, one of the things that we noticed in the uh, intersection between Bonaire Road and Magnolia is that the curb and gutter is significantly lower than the existing uh, infrastructure. And so we're wondering why that is and whether or not that um, additional reduction in height is going to exacerbate the, f the flooding at that intersection. Because we've already noticed in the past water at that point uh, comment. Um, the uh, Bonaire uh, a road approach, the, the approach pump station is, I guess, what I'm going to call it at this point because it's supposedly the uh, <coughs> pump station that's going to take care of the floodwaters on the approach road to the Bonaire Bridge. And somehow we've been lumped into that pumping station to handle the floodwaters inside Hillview. Um, and because of this, the pump station is only able to handle a 25-year event. Um, we don't feel that that's adequate. We've been paying on flood, uh, you know, <coughs> protection money basically to the Zone 9 flood district for 10 years, and yet we're going to be given a 25-year event when everybody upstream is getting the 100-year flood event. Uh, we don't think that's appropriate. We should probably be, be thinking about a flood or a pump station for the Hillview neighborhood. Um, the third thing is in Mr. Skinner's uh, uh, bridge replacement project status report, talked about GSBI working on the pump station, and we are under the impression that there were no designs for that pump station, that they were still being reviewed. And I believe that was talked about in the Flood Zone 9 meeting last time. We're wondering why that is and why there wasn't an opportunity for public comment at that time. Um, it seems like we're pretty far down the road. Um, probably not an opportunity now to do any changes to that pump station should the community want to. Um, and so I guess that's what leads us to think that this must be a pump station driven primarily by the bridge replacement and the requirement of Caltrans to pump the floodwaters off the road rather than something that's to, there to protect the Hillview neighborhood. So we'd like to know, have, have some sort of indication where we are with that and why that came down to that, that um, process. Um, also, the I know it may not be the appropriate venue for this, but the, one of the reasons why we have such a flooding problem in Hillview, and if any of you have been driving through there in the last few rains, you notice that um, Cornell especially has a lot of flooding. Even Every time the tide comes in, there, it, there's flooding on that road. What we hope and we gather is that the pump station will, will minimize that or at least reduce it. But... Um, I th we think it's exacerbated by the fact that the, f the water is coming down from the uh, Skylark Apartments or the King Mountain area. And wondering why that wasn't disassociated from the Hillview uh, <coughs> storm drainage during this process. Another thing that we think would should have been addressed by the Flood Zone 9 project. 
I know that there are some some uh, designs for like settling and and possibly some uh, I call it a leach field, but nobody likes that term. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I guess that's a, that's the, one of the, the four biggest things we'd like to comment on for this project, and at least get some clarification, especially on the pump station and why it isn't more robust and why it isn't uh, at least backed up by emergency power. And, uh, you know, homeowners can don't, don't have the advantages of businesses where you can write off losses, uh, especially considering now the, the people in Sausalito that were taken out by the mudslides and they're, they're now their insurance companies are refusing to pay. Really a sad state, in my opinion. But um, anyway, that's the end of my comments. Thanks, I'd like Steve. to... Uh, you can give them to Jamie, Steve. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Do we want to answer any of the? I think Mr. Skinner. Will. Yeah, I can answer as we go, or wait for all the comments and answer at the end, whatever your preference is. Why don't you answer okay. the ones that just? Okay. Um, so the gentleman was talking about uh, the pump station, and then uh, mentioned the adjacent Hillview uh, neighborhood, and and also mentioned flood zone nine. Um, so yeah, the pump station is included in the Bonaire Bridge project. Um, it was bid, it was designed with the bridge project and it was bid as part of uh, the bridge project. Um, the pump station was designed to accommodate flow both from the approach road to the bridge that's within the footprint of the bridge project and also flow from the adjacent Hillview subdivision. Um, so, yes, the pump station itself has been designed, was included in the bid, and the contractor now is working on their submittals. Um, what has not been designed yet is the drainage in Hillview. So all of the storm drains in Hillview need to be designed such that they will flow to the pump station. That's the part of the design that has not been completed yet. Uh, where that flow ends up in the pump station, that part has been designed. Um, and then uh, the pump station uh, basically was designed to be as large as can physically fit in that uh, location. Uh, one of the components of sizing a pump station is, is the wet well, uh, which is basically a storage tank for the storm drain water that comes uh, to the pump station and then gets pumped out. Uh, so the pumps and the physical amount of space we had to install a storage is as large as could be accommodated at that site. So that's what governs the size of the pump station. Um, and you typically do not design pump stations for 100 year or even 50 year events. They would simply be so huge and to, design, to spend double the money for something that's going to be a benefit once every 50 years does not pencil out. So. Uh, we go through an evaluation process where it's the same when we design our storm drains. They're sized for a certain event. Anything that goes beyond that flows uh, down the streets. Um, so in this case, what we're looking at is we know there's a certain capacity of the pump stations. Um, when the flow in that neighborhood gets to a point where it gets beyond what the pump station can handle, it will go through backup overflow pipes out to the creek so that it won't be any worse than the condition is today. Uh, the pump station will basically take care of the um, king tide flooding that that neighborhood experiences. We know there's street flooding there. Even when it doesn't rain, mm -hmm. that will be eliminated with the pump station. And then it will take care of storm events on top of tidal events up to about a 10-year event or so. Once you get beyond the 10-year event, uh, we're dealing with issues such as the gentleman mentioned Cornell. Um, the inlets on Cornell and the low point in Cornell is about three feet below what the FEMA 100-year flood elevation is, and we can't, we're not raising the subdivision, and so as we get beyond a 10-year storm, we're going to have to use those uh, existing outfalls to let the water um, out of the subdivision. And then um, he also mentioned the separating the water from King Mountain. That's exactly what we plan on doing. So we plan on isolating those systems so that the subdivision drainage goes to the pump station and what comes down King Mountain will not commingle with that drainage and will go out to the creek. Um, and that we don't want to take all of that water that's coming off the hill and take it through the pump station because then it will diminish the amount of Hillview water that we can push out through the pump station. So we're definitely uh, doing that. So Julian, do you call, call that a detention basin, that area? 
Um, n well, no. So there, in our old storm drain master plan, there was talks of a detention basin for um, the flow that comes down King Mountain, but that's not in the works now. It'll simply be separated, and it'll it'll discharge directly out into the creek, uh, separate from the Hillview um, flow. And then the question about emergency power. So uh, two of our pump stations currently do have emergency by, uh, power. Um, the others do not. Um, this pump station at this site was designed without emergency backup power. We're working with the designers now uh, to figure out how much it would cost to add emergency backup power to this location. Um, and then also working with Caltrans to get it through their process to see if it would uh, be approved for uh, funding. Okay. And I think nice I, job. I hit most of the points. I, I you answered it. Great. All right. Thank you. Oh, I did forget when I saw it. My first thing I missed: uh, the curbs at Magnolia and Bonaire being lower than uh, what they are now, and the fact that there is drainage issues at that location. Those curbs are lower specifically to eliminate the ponding issues that we used to see at Bonaire and Magnolia. Mm -hmm. uh, the road had limited cross slope there, meaning it was flat in some areas, and so it was hard when it rained. We had a lot of puddles, and it was hard for the water to get out. Uh, we are actually lowering, we're keeping the elevation of the middle of Magnolia the same, and we're lowering the two sides so that the water sheds off the road quicker. Um, even though those islands are lower, it means the water will draw off Magnolia quicker. That The islands are not lower than the flood level of the creek. Everything drains down to the creek, so it will not make that intersection more flood prone, it will just make the drainage there actually work better. That's great. Thank you. Arlene, how are you? Hi. Fine. Thank you. Can you say your name and address, uh, Arlene please? Fox, Hillview. I just want to follow up on a couple of things that Steve mentioned. Uh, initially, there was talk about that pump station providing for 25-year flood coverage, and then it was downgraded to about 15 years. So that is of concern. Um, Julian talked about uh, the outflows to the creek as extra precaution, correct? And my concern is that the flood control zone 9 is not dredging, so those outfalls will end up getting plugged. So I'm wondering what kind of remediation will uh, address that. Uh, let's see. Uh, regarding the, you said that the Runoff from King Mountain will be separated. Does that include the runoff from Skylark Apartments? Okay. So it's both. Okay, appreciate that. And uh, just a side note regarding the bridge approaches, there are a couple potholes that are getting kind of dangerous. Uh, frequently when I drive through there, I have to kind of maneuver and it's really tight it's the there. county, I know. So it'd be really great if the city could fill those potholes. Them, yeah. They're on this side of um, Bayview Road, so I believe that is city property. Okay. So, thank you. Thanks, Arlene. Julie, anyone want to answer the Yeah, so questions? regarding the outfalls and the potential for them being plugged, we are working with Flood Zone 9. Um, they're a funding partner uh, with the Hillview imp improvements, and so we've been working with their staff and discussing um, of the many outfalls that are already there out of Hillview, which ones would make the most sense to be retained and improved uh, to be the overflow uh, for both the King Mountain and the Skylark and also uh, for the pump station. And then, yes, the what's coming over the hill, uh, for the most part, gets separated. Uh, the King Mountain and Skylark, there is some, there is a little bit that comes from the other side. and. Um, Probably to, to, to clarify this, we are, uh, as we move forward with the Hillview project, we'll be having a public workshop. Um, and then we'll also be having a presentation at the Flood Zone Advisory Board, and we'll be going over all of these things in way more detail as far as how the drainage, we propose to modify the drainage and what's going through the pump station and what we're going to divert and what will be commingled. So we'll be able to get into a lot more um, details at that point. And then, um, yeah, as far as potholes go, um, call Public Works or send Public Works uh, uh, an email. Uh, with rain comes potholes, and um, there are, yeah, there are some weird county city jurisdiction lines, so as much information as possible when you report a, a pothole, if you have a physical address or just south of or just north of or a cross street. Um, helps and then uh, we don't ignore it if it's in the county we pass it on to them so if you're not sure let us know
Good. I know I complained about a couple and you filled it that, that day, so I appreciate that. Any other questions from the, from the public? All right, I see none. I'll bring it back to the council. Any more questions? Thank you, Julian. Yeah, Julian, thank you. Nice thank job. You. Oh, wait, Larry has a question. Yeah, um, I, I guess Councilmember Harolf is here and so, so is staff, but, you know, it, it still seems like one of the key issues that was also raised by um, Ms. Fox is that we still have the dredging issue. You know, no matter how much water that we try and mitigate, it still needs to go into the creek, and that still is a, our, our primary point of failure at this point. So, has, has, I mean, is there really any discussion at Flood Zone 9 about what they're doing downstream? I know Dan Hilmer has tried to raise it, but since the last set of meetings, I'm not sure if we've gotten any updates on that. I can add something, but go ahead if you want. Um, yeah, so um, the, the Flood Zone 9 does have um, a project um, in their CIP that's evaluating the lower quarter Madera Creek. Um, they're looking um, at evaluating opportunities for new levees and, and flood walls, and they're also looking at um, opportunities for dredging and something called a geomorphic dredge, which is kind of like a smart dredge. Um, and that is something that's supposed to be sustaining because I, I think those of us that have experienced the dredges in the past and you've seen the curves as the year after you dredge a, a whole section of it fills up again naturally um, And so there is some funding to do the studies um, and they're trying to make a determination on what the appropriate uh, steps would be forward for dredging whether it is a regular dredge or whether it's a geomorphic dredge um, and then um, after that determination, they would still have to look ahead to, to the flooding. And, and I think, you know, as you look at the lower Corte Madera Creek, um, the other issue is not just what's coming down the creek, but what's coming back from sea level. And so as you start making the creek deep, deeper, um, only has so many benefits uh, when you're looking at the, the, the bay coming in. Uh, making the creek deeper makes a lot more sense further up the, the drainage course where you're really dealing with runoff as opposed to uh, backflow from the bay. Yeah, one of the fears I have is that there are certain areas that are starting to look like a wetland. Yeah. So it, it changes the whole way in which you deal with the creek. You know, different set of rules. Um, with so within, I'm not. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case when you're talking about the main channel and it's within the the ordinary high water level I, I i don't think that those areas if you're talking about the areas you see at low tide i think as long as they're below the high water mark um what they look like at low tide doesn't doesn't really matter it's um the areas that get reclassified are uh, more in the flatlands that are in the uplands that get water um in them as the level rises that didn't used to get water but what's within the where the tides go in the water doesn't doesn't lose that classification or doesn't change a, a classification based on what it looks like at low tide. Okay, thank you. Great. Anyone else? Heather? Just just to uh, follow on on that point, um, it it has been a persistent um, frustration to uh, have the concerns that we have in the lower reaches of the creek, um, given a, a, a low priority within Zone 9 and the projects that they've considered over time. Um, and I know uh, Council Member Hilmer has um, expressed those concerns repeatedly within the framework of, of, of that process, um, and will continue to do so. Um, but also, as Julian points out, it, it is a complicated uh, setting because of, it's not just an issue of downstream flows, but it's also an issue of, of the influence from the bay. And, you know, I've been a little bit more involved than, than Dan, I think, actually, in terms of the work that the county has done and that the communities around Marin have been working on um, to address the challenges that are going to be presented by sea level rise over the next decades. And um, that is that area. Uh, of the creek is a prime example of where those issues kind of come together. So I'm hoping that notwithstanding frustrations we've had with the Zone 9 process and the priorities that they've had, is that by bringing into um, our assessment of the challenges that we have, 
uh, through sea level rise that we're going to create additional opportunities to help mitigate some of the challenges that we have in that area. Hopefully they won't punt on the flood control and reclassify it as sea level rise and then push the whole thing down. No. <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, uh, no. Uh, and not as long as I'm part of that process. Yes, okay. that's what Thank we you. want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want to say something? Well, I was going to maybe say we were drifting a bit far from the agendized topic. But uh, to bring it back so that we're covered, uh, I think what we've underscored is we've done the best we can with the project within the jurisdiction that we control and the issues that have been raised involve the county and jurisdiction we don't actually get to manage. So uh, there are partners and we're in dialogue with them and uh, trying to find mutual solutions. Thank you for adding that piece. Julia, nice job. Thank you for answering all the questions and a great presentation. Appreciate it. We love having you as our public work director. All right, with that, I think we're done. I will adjourn. May I have a motion to adjourn the council meeting? So, so moved. And second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you for coming. You. Steve, nice to see you. See you. It's been a while. Okay.